This morning is our One God, One Story lesson being the last Sunday of the month, and this month brings us to the book of Joshua. So excited to consider some thoughts from the book of Joshua. And if you're visiting with us, first of all, we're thankful that you're here. And second of all, uh, we might need a little recap to get you up to the point where we're at and what we're doing with this series. But the point of the series, which we're calling One God, One Story, is to try to uh, take a passage from each book of the Bible and go through that in a lesson and try to pick a passage that helps us tie that book's story in to the overall biblical narrative as a whole. And so that's what we're doing. We've gone through uh, five books of the Bible. We've gone through the entire Pentateuch so far. Uh, and so that brings us to Joshua this morning. But just to recap, in Genesis, we talked about the sign of the covenant. Of course, God gives the promises to Abraham in chapter 12 of Genesis, and then he gives the covenant in chapter 15, and then he confirms all that through the sign of the covenant in chapter 17. So we talked about that and how God is a God of covenant faithfulness and promise and that sort of thing. And then we talked about uh, how God promises deliverance and gives deliverance in the book of Exodus. And so not only does God make promises, but he makes sure that they are fulfilled and, and he keeps those promises. And, and then we looked in Leviticus about how God, yes, keeps covenant, but he has covenant expectations of his covenant people uh, in Leviticus. He divides and he names things. He says, these are my people and this is what they are to do, as opposed to these are not my people this is not what I have called my people to do. Uh, so he separates things. He makes things holy and unholy, calls them out of what is unholy. So we saw that in Leviticus. We're learning a lot about who God is and, and the kind of God that he is through this study. And then in, in the book of Numbers, we looked at the, the report of the spies, the evil report, actually, that the spies gave uh, in that book and what happens when the Lord is with us and what happens when the Lord is not with us and how we ought to fight when God says fight and be ready to go when he calls us to go and do whatever it is he calls us to do. But if he has not called us to do something and he said, do not go, we will surely fail in that effort. Uh, and that applies across all areas of our lives, just as it did in the day of those people uh, who perished in the wilderness as punishment for that. And then finally, uh, last month, we looked at the greatest commandment in Deuteronomy chapter six and how the whole purpose of the Torah is ultimately to lead Israel to love God and to be faithful to him uh, and to love him with all their heart and with all their soul and all their strength. So that brings us this morning to the book of Joshua. And the passage I want to preach from is Joshua 24 uh, in verses 1 through 18. And you're probably very familiar with verse 15 of that chapter, uh, which is that verse about choose this day whom you'll serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And again, thankful uh, that Darren led that song. We got to get that in, in our heads. But I think there's more context in this chapter that I had not considered, at least in quite some time, that makes that statement all the more impactful. And so I want to consider all of that with you uh, this morning. But not only as it stands on its own, but even that passage in the context of the whole book of Joshua, where Israel is at at this point, where God's covenant people are at, and also in the context of the entire Bible so far, and the Torah that has just preceded it, those first five books. Uh, and you'll also notice that the word covenant keeps coming up in these studies. And so that's one thing that we notice right off the bat is God is a God of covenant. He desires covenant relationship with his people. And we will see him continue to seek that even here in the book of Joshua. But like I said, I want to consider this passage, first of all, in the context of the book of Joshua. So just to sum up Joshua real quick to get us to this point, because this is at the end of the book. Uh, so at the beginning of the book of Joshua, the leadership of Israel transitions. You have Moses who passes away at the end of Deuteronomy, and then Joshua assumes uh, the leadership role in Israel at the beginning of the book. And from there, what happens is really the conquest of the land. They go ahead and carry out the majority of, of, of the conquest. And Joshua leads those people in that conquering of the land of promise. And so that takes place and is successful. And then in the kind of the second half of the book of Joshua, the land is divided. It's allotted to the tribes, divided among the people. And that's kind of, as I was reading through the book, that's kind of when, to me, it gets really real that this is happening. This promise is being fulfilled. This is one of the big three promises. They've already become a great nation, even in Egypt. Now they're getting this promised land. Uh, 
that, that God had promised to Abraham all the way back in Genesis 12. And so this promise has been in their heads for a long time. And it's been talked about a lot in Deuteronomy, especially as they're anticipating that, which we're studying right now. But here in Joshua, it gets real. They're splitting up the land. They're saying, this is your property. You're in this tribe. This is your land. And that's, that's different from what we've, we've read so far. It, it's kind of like, I think of when you get the keys to the house. Buying a house can be a long process. You got to figure out what you want, wait until something comes on the market that looks good to you. And then when you find it, there's inspections and there's negotiations and there's realtors that have to talk to each other and, and, and get involved in that. And then you have to start packing things up from your old house in anticipation of going to the new. And then you have to move. And then, But on that day when you get the keys, you say, okay, this is your house. Something changes. It feels a little more real. And so maybe that's not a perfect illustration of what's happening here, but you get the idea of this is real. They're, they're getting the keys to the promised land now. They're ready to, to move in and settle. And so this promise that has been part of their, their longing and their history for so long is, is happening. And so then the allotment of land concludes in chapter 21. Uh, and so in chapter 22, the eastern tribes who fulfilled their promise where they said, okay, we'll help you conquer the land, the ones who had land east of the Jordan, they, they passed through that and they said, well, we'll come help you before we uh, go back home and settle ourselves. So they fulfill the promise and then chapter 22, they, they return home having done uh, all that they said they would do. And then in chapter 23, Joshua summons all Israel's elders and leaders. And he charges them to love the Lord their God and to be careful to keep all God's commandments written in the book of the law. Well, that sounds just like Deuteronomy summarized right there. <laughs> Love God and be careful to do all that is written in the book of the law. So he's summing that up, which we have talked uh, a good deal about even in uh, last month's lesson. And that brings us to what happens in Joshua 24. So I'd invite you this morning to Joshua 24 and let's read what happens there. Joshua chapter 24, and we'll begin reading in verse 1. Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and summoned the elders, the heads, the judges, and the officers of Israel. And they presented themselves before God. And Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Long ago your fathers lived beyond the Euphrates, Terah, the father of Abraham and of Nahor, and they served other gods. Then I took your father Abraham from beyond the river and led him through all the land of Canaan and made his offspring many. I gave him Isaac. And to Isaac I gave Jacob and Esau, and I gave Esau the hill country of Seir to possess, but Jacob and his children went down to Egypt. And I sent Moses and Aaron, and I plagued Egypt with what I did in the midst of it, and afterward I brought you out. Then I brought your fathers out of Egypt, and you came to the sea. And the Egyptians pursued your fathers with chariots and horsemen to the Red Sea, and when they cried to the Lord, he put darkness between you and the Egyptians, and made the sea come upon them and cover them. And your eyes saw what I did in Egypt." And you lived in the wilderness a long time. Then I brought you to the land of the Amorites who lived on the other side of the Jordan. They fought with you and I gave them into your hand. And you took possession of their land and I destroyed them before you. Then Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, arose and fought against Israel. And he sent and invited Balaam, the son of Beor, to curse you. But I would not listen to Balaam. Indeed, he blessed you. So I delivered you out of his hand. And you went over the Jordan and came to Jericho, and the leaders of Jericho fought against you, and also the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, and I gave them into your hand. And I sent the hornet before you, which drove them out before you, the two kings of the Amorites. It was not by your sword or by your bow. I gave you a land on which you had not labored, and cities that you had not built, and you dwell in them. You eat the fruit of vineyards and olive orchards that you did not plant." Joshua 24 here begins, we'll stop there for now. This text begins by saying that the people of Israel presented themselves before God. And Joshua speaks on behalf of God and renews the covenant with Israel. That's what's happening here. The, the covenant's being renewed. But notice, this is not God returning to his covenant after he was unfaithful and forgot about Israel for a period of time. Rather, this is simply a reminder to Israel that God has been faithful to his covenant and will continue to be faithful to the covenant. However, as we've continually been reminded of through this study, a covenant is made between two parties. It is not a one-sided operation. 
And Joshua, therefore, then turns to the people and speaks to their part of the covenant. So let's read the next five verses, starting in verse 14 of Joshua 24. Now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. And if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your father served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And the people answered, far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For it is the Lord our God who brought us and our fathers up from the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, and who did those great signs in our sight and preserved us in all the way that we went and among all the peoples through whom we passed. And the Lord drove out before us all the peoples, the Amorites who lived in the land. Therefore, we also will serve the Lord, for he is our God. So Joshua says in the earlier part of chapter 24 that God has done his part. God's renewing and really just reminding them of him keeping his part of the covenant. And now Joshua turns to the people. And that's where the shift happens there in verse 14. He says, now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him. And, and that's what Joshua is doing. But God's renewal of the covenant and Joshua's call to Israel to rededicate themselves to keeping the covenant on their end show us several key things that remind Israel and us of what rededication to a covenant, God's covenant, looks like. And that's what I want to consider with you from this text this morning. What rededication to this covenant looks like. The first thing I think we see that it looks like is it, it involves a high regard for your history with God. As God's people, it involves a high regard for your past experiences with God. And that's primarily what God's renewal of the covenant looks like. If you look at verses 2 through 13, those are entirely spent looking back on what has happened to Israel in the past. And so history was absolutely indispensable for Israel. It was critical to them. Hence why so much of the Torah, especially Deuteronomy that we've been looking at, it really just contains retellings of events that have already taken place for God's people. And of course, that's also why having conquered the land just now, Joshua does the same thing again. He recounts the history of the children of Israel. So history is important for God's people. But I think we need to notice what an accurate retelling of Israel's history really looks like. Consider with me here in verses 2 through 13, all the things that God, through Joshua, calls to mind from the, the nation's past, from their history. He starts by saying, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel... And then here's all the things he lists. I took Abraham, God says. I gave him Isaac. I sent Moses and Aaron. I plagued Egypt. I brought you out. The Lord, or I, put darkness between you and the Egyptians. The Lord made the sea cover them. And he returns to the first person. I brought you to the land of the Amorites. I gave them into your hand. I destroyed them before you. I would not listen to Balaam. I delivered you out of Balaam's hand. I gave them, all the, the ites, you know, the those people, I gave them into your hand. I sent the hornet before you. And the conclusion of all this is, I gave you a land. And what that tells them is, God has been faithful to the promises he made as far back as Genesis 12 to give them this nation and this land. And so what we see, and I want you to, what I want you to notice here, is that history is indispensable for God's people both then and now because it points us to what God has done, not what we have done. It reminds us of how faithful and great God is to his promises, to his covenant, and to his people. And really, this is true for all God's people. God's covenant renewal here shows us that history was key for Israel, and the New Testament tells us and shows us that history is pretty important for us today as well as Christians. Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in verse 11, I think is a passage that I think of a lot when this comes to mind. I don't have this on the screen, so if you want to turn over there, I'll read a few verses there in Ephesians 2, beginning in verse 11. Ephesians 2, 11 says, Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. 
But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. So a lot of these things carry over. God has promised us a land as well. We await a land of promise just as Israel did. But if we lose the full picture of our history and what God has done for us, we lose our ability to appreciate what he has done, what he will do for us, and who he is as a God of covenant faithfulness and redemption. So remembering where we were, where each of us was, making this personal, remembering that we were without hope, and then considering how God called us, delivered us, freed us, changed us, fought for us, and will give us a land too, gives us a perspective that we desperately need if we are to remain faithful to God. That's really what this is about. When things quickly begin to go south, just a few chapters later, in the book of Judges, it gets really messy really fast. And the reason given that people stop serving the Lord is that there arose a generation who no longer knew the work the Lord had done for Israel. Which you might think, how could they possibly, after so much time is spent, be careful, teach your children, teach your children, teach your children in Deuteronomy over and over again. Don't let a generation arise that doesn't know the Lord and what he has done and what he expects of you. And guess what happens? A generation arises that doesn't know the Lord and what he has done. But you know, that danger is just as real today as it was for Israel. If we forget where we were before God brought us near through Jesus, calling us, delivering us, and transferring us into his kingdom, then we may, just like Israel, lose our love for God and our appreciation for what he has done. And that can lead us to quickly turn away from serving him faithfully, just as Israel did. So for God's people, both then and now, History is indispensable. You might not be a history fan. Might not have been your favorite subject in school. It was mine, but I'll confess. But even if it was not yours, it's important as a Christian in a greater sense than any other history that you can learn. And the point of it all is this. Never forget what God has done for you. Always remember what God has done, most especially what he has done for you spiritually. But not only does Joshua's address emphasize that dedication to the covenant starts with a high regard for the history of what God has done for them, but it also emphasizes that being dedicated to God's covenant means fearing the Lord and serving him in sincerity and faithfulness. And drawing on what we just talked about, it's really only if you forget who you are and what God has done for you in addition to what God has done punitively to the other nations, could you possibly fail to fear the Lord? Now, these things build on each other. I mean, if you look back, God could easily say, and he has said, he's done amazing things for you. He called Abraham. He gave him Isaac. He sent Moses and Aaron. He brought you out of Egypt, brought you to the land. He delivered you. He gave all the people into your hand. That's all in that history right there in that first part of chapter 24. But he has also done mighty acts of fearful judgment for the nations and the people who did evil, who continually did evil. And that's in that same history. He plagued Egypt. He drowned Egypt in the Red Sea. He destroyed the Amorites. He sent the hornet on people. And so what those things can do is they can remind us of how great God is, but also inspire a healthy fear for the greatness of God, which we need whether we are following him or especially if, if we are not, and we need to be reminded to turn back to him. And so the natural response to that fear and healthy respect for the greatness of God can only be serve the Lord and fear him alone. And the people do commit to this, to their credit. Verses 16 through 18 show us that. That's where they say, oh, we will serve the Lord. Far be it from us that we would forsake the Lord. We're going to serve him. He's our God. Look at what he's done for us. How could we not serve him? But what is made clear is that it is only if you serve him alone in sincerity and faithfulness that you will continue to enjoy his blessings and not his righteous judgment. So, if we decide to serve him, though, 
which is what he wants of us. He wants us to fear him and serve him exclusively. But if we decide to do that, God has made it clear, and I think this, this phrase is so helpful in determining what God wants of us. God has made it clear that what he desires is our sincerity and our faithfulness. Our sincerity and our faithfulness. I think that dichotomy is important. Both elements have to be there. Many people today want to claim that as long as you're sincere in your worship, or you're sincere in wanting to please God in what you believe and what you practice, that it doesn't matter exactly what you do, as long as you're sincere, and that God just wants your, wants your heart. But still others, on the other hand, want to go to the opposite extreme and say that it doesn't matter if you're sincere or not. What matters is that you check all the boxes and obey every command exactly and do what it says perfectly. So which is it? Well, God has told his people, even here in the days of Joshua, this is not an old question. So God's told them, though, that he doesn't want to choose between having servants who are sincere and love him and, and give him their heart between that and people who actually follow his commands and do what he has called them to do. God is saying he wants both. This is not an either or, it is a both and. And so, yes, he wants us to love him with our whole heart and to worship him because we truly want to praise him. And yes, he also wants us to be faithful to his word, to what he has asked of his people. It does not have to be an either or. The answer really can be yes. And that's what God called his people to even hear. That's what fearing the Lord looks like, is, is loving him and having that response to what he has done, but also serving him in faithfulness. Deuteronomy helps us emphasize that quite a bit, where it talks so much about the heart, but it also talks so much about being careful to do all the commands and the law of the Lord. So rededicating ourselves to the covenant looks like fearing the Lord. And what that means is serving him not only in sincerity, giving him our hearts and loving him, but also serving him in faithfulness to the covenant and God's covenant expectations. And then finally, Joshua then reminds the people of Israel that dedication to the covenant means choosing God alone, choosing God over family heritage, and choosing God over the gods, little g, of your neighbors and your surrounding society. He gives us that idea there in verse 15, where he says, Choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your fathers served in the region beyond the river, speaking of Terah and, and those, those false gods beyond the Euphrates, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. And of course, he says that famous statement, but as for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. But he, he talks about the gods of their fathers. He says, don't serve them. He talks about their neighbor's gods. He says, don't serve them either. Let's talk about the gods of their fathers, though, first. He tells them, choose the, the one true God over the gods of even your fathers. I mean, in the case of Israel, what he's telling us here is their ancestors served false gods beyond the river. And of course, verse 2 clues us into the fact that that refers to Abraham's father, Terah, who was an idolater and lived beyond the Euphrates River. And while the Israelites could look back to Abraham and see a great example of faithfulness to God, of, of worship and, and uh, loving God exclusively, they could also look back one more generation to Terah and see an example of blatant idolatry. So therefore, Joshua tells them clearly, do not serve the gods of your fathers. And I think that's important not only for them, but for us too. We, we all have varying spiritual legacies. Some of us are blessed with a family lineage full of New Testament Christians. Some of us, not so much. But whether we look back in our families and see faithful service to God, disregard for God, or even a form of service to God that didn't truly submit wholly to Him, what is true for all of us is that what we must do is decide for ourselves to serve the Lord and Him alone. There is great danger in simply trying to inherit our parents' religion, even if they served the Lord. I, I'm not trying to discount the critical importance of, of parents who left positive spiritual legacies for us as their children. That's a huge blessing. But what we see from Israel's family history is that while there were good examples in their family, there were also very poor spiritual examples. 
And that's why there can be so much danger in just following your parents spiritually. And so what I think Joshua shows us and tells us here is that the only way to certainly avoid such a danger in our own lives is to do as Joshua commanded Israel. And to choose for ourselves to follow, not our parents, but to just follow, seek, and serve the Lord alone. But not only does Joshua say there to choose the one true God over the gods of even their fathers, but he tells them they ought to choose the one true God over the gods of their neighbors as well. Not only will there inevitably be, inevitably be some negative spiritual examples in our families, it's kind of the implication of this, but there's almost certainly going to be negative spiritual examples around us in the world. People sinning and not regarding God. And the truth is, that's, a, that's the nature of a world into which sin has entered. That's where we live. That's just how it goes. And God has required different things from his people over the centuries in terms of how they deal with living in such a world. Abram was to leave behind the communities in which he lived where that idol worship was happening continually. In Israel's day, they were to destroy all the evil and idolatrous nations who had rejected the Lord. And of course, in our day, God has called us to live holy lives centered around a heavenly kingdom in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. But the common denominator throughout all the ages is that God's people are always to recognize that when living in a world where many people are not worshiping or living in ways that please God, it's going to be tempting to look around, see what everybody else is doing, and to want to do that. That temptation is just going to be there. But our basic task remains the same as it was for Abraham, same as it was for Israel, and the same as it's been for all the rest of God's people, which is you have a choice between following family, following others, or following God alone. Choose God. Choose God. That's the task for all of us this morning, is to choose God. And so let us all renew our dedication to the new covenant. This invitation is going to be more for those of us who are Christians. So you don't even have songbooks to pull out, so don't lose me here. But ask yourself this morning, have you truly chosen God? Not the gods of your family and not your parents' religion, but God alone. Have you truly chosen God? Not just what everyone else is doing, but God alone. Make sure your dedication is to him. Another question, do you remember your history with God? Do you remember how he has delivered you from slavery to sin out of that bondage? Do you keep that in mind regularly? Do you have that appreciation for what God's done for you and the change that he's brought about in you for the better? And then is your life marked by deep and reverent fear of the Lord and service to him in both sincerity and faithfulness? Do you love God with all your heart? And are you also dedicated to doing what he's asked of you as his covenant people? And then have you decided, like Joshua, that for you and your family, you're not just going to follow your family, you're not going to follow your neighbors, but your family is going to follow the one true and living God? Have you made that decision? That's what Joshua was calling Israel to when he told them to choose that day who they would serve in that famous statement. And folks, we're called to make the same choice today. And so my deepest hope and prayer for all of us, for every single one of us, is that we choose God, that we choose the one true and living God in all things. I hope those thoughts are helpful to you, challenging to you as they have been to me. And uh, I, I pray that, again, all of us choose the Lord in everything. If we can help you with a spiritual need this morning, we'd love to do that. Or if we can talk more after services, we'd love to do that too. Whatever we can do to help make sure you are right with God and that you are in a covenant relationship with him that brings blessings greater than anything else, we'd love to help you do that as we stand and sing.